the Quran itself says we strike we can we can strike a similitude between a gnat or a lesser creature. And by such similitudes, by such symbols, we lead some into heaven and some into hell. I'm expecting none of this. Um, this goes counter to many of the things that are that, that are said in the in the Torah and the Tanakh. Um, hello, my friends. This is my brother Sharu Shadbach. He's come here today to talk to us. Uh, he has a great deal to do with bridging beliefs, including a lot of editing behind the scenes, and discussion, dialogue, and research. Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to try and look at having some dialogue surrounding certain topics. In this case, the topic in particular is the divinus error. Yeah, we were talking about this a few days ago, and you had said that you'd been working on, on this subject for quite a while, um, compiling quotes and just contemplating the issue in general. Um, I think it might help to even just discuss or what is the divinus error? What does that even mean? Like what, okay. like the larger context and outside the Baha'i use of it. The divinus error to me is that within the context of the world's religions, when the messengers of God come, they come in ways that test us, that challenge our preconceived notions of how they should appear. This kind of seems... Uh counter to what many people who within certain um, religious groups may feel. Because I mean, the, the impression that I get at least, and I could be wrong, from a lot of Christians um, and Muslims and, and, and individuals in general is that, is that when their, um, I want to call it prophet, because then there's charged <laughs> language yeah. around that, but when their, uh, their, their, their central figure comes forward and brings the divine message, uh, whether it be Christ or Prophet Muhammad or whoever, um, uh, it's seen as though it's super obvious. When, when Christ came, he performed miracles, and how could you not miss it? Uh, those are the, the famous 313 you know, prophecies from the Old yeah. Testament yeah. <laughs> that, it, that, that Christ revealed. Not to make light of it or, or joke mm -hmm. about it, but just meaning that it was just so obvious and so spectacular that mm -hmm. um, you really had to be blind and stubborn and dark-hearted and cold-hearted to to not recognize, um, and to a certain extent, maybe to a lesser extent with, uh, with Islam, mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it's there as well. Um, so how, basically, maybe I'm asking, where is this coming from? Where is this concept of like, that it ought to be hard, or that ought to be challenging, um, whereas the common perception is that it isn't. Maybe that's a wrong perception based on scripture, yeah. um, but what do you think? I mean, there's two sides. I think one we have to look at actually just the way the world is set up, generally speaking, outside of the religious context. And the other part is to look at the particular traditions. Um, when I look at the Old Testament, uh, for example, say in the coming of Moses, you had individuals murmuring against him, refusing him, rejecting. Uh, you had opposition to the, to the, if you will, the revelation of Moses in the Torah um, by his own people for extended periods of time. I understand what you're saying. You're having this side where you see the miraculous events uh, in the context of Jesus' life, but you also have this other side where Christ is asking his miracles not to be spoken of, and you still have the Sanhedrin and a large number of people actually opposing the mission of Jesus Christ, which is why both he's being crucified and why he's being opposed by the Jewish people. Um, likewise, you'll have the miraculous events and profound authority and sovereignty being claimed by the, the Islamic community for the person of the Prophet Muhammad, yet at the same time you have decades and decades of persecution and opposition. Mm -hmm. So why is this happening? You have, uh, if you will, and again, like you said, not to speak of it in a disparaging way, but the fantastical being attributed to the person of the Buddha, for example, in the Pali Canon, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time you have decades and decades of individuals who are not accepting, decades of people yeah. in opposition. So how do you square that? Yeah. Uh, so that's one side of it. And the other side is, is that, like you said, you, you generally have this idea that, oh, it was so obvious, for, for example, with the prophecies of Jesus' first coming and all his miracles, and yet at the same time, when Jesus came, his message appeared, at least to the Jewish people, in ways that they weren't expecting. Mm. 
Um, they were expecting a conquering Messiah. They were yeah. expecting an individual named Emmanuel, if you're, if you're yeah. using the prophecies of the New Testament. So you have this other side of it where it's like... And they definitely weren't expecting someone to claim divinity of any kind. No. <laughs> that goes no. starkly against what they're expecting. Yeah, they weren't expecting, a, if you will, and again, not to, to, to belittle it, but a God-man. Yeah. Um, they were expecting a Jewish ruler that would actually deliver them from the yoke of the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not expecting a crucified Messiah, which is, again, palpably obvious from the New Testament. Right? That actually, you know, crucified, or a curse is him is crucified upon a tree. Yeah. You actually have the epistles of Paul trying to respond to the fact that the Jewish Messiah was crucified. You have the New Testament trying to respond to the fact that the law of Moses was abrogated or removed or disappeared, whatever term you wish to use. You also have instances within the New Testament where Jesus used the concept, for example, of, you know, eating his body and drinking his blood. Yeah. And it's being done to a group of individuals who have kosher food laws. So sometimes you have the message of, and we're using the New Testament in this example, being presented in ways that are upsetting or disturbing or off-putting to the Jewish people. Yeah. And I think that it's regularly missed. I think within the Islamic community, there is at times a lack of sensitivity and empathy for the Christian mind. It's underappreciated. It's really underappreciated. How shocking some of the, even language and some of the terms that are being used in the Quran and within the Islamic community are to the Christian community. Yeah. Um, and I think the same problem exists within the context of the Christian community. They forget, because of the social dominance of the Christian faith, they actually forget how challenging it would have been, both in the past and challenging it would be now, and to hear the message of Jesus Christ. For sure, and the interesting yeah. thing about it is that it's not not only was it challenging, but it was the 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 sort of the hurdle to get around is that it was challenging on purpose because that's the claim. Is yes, that, is that and especially when you see in in, in the in the the, the, the scriptures in the, in the New Testament, Christ says, "I came as a stumbling block," meaning yeah, and a rock he, of offense. He intended to come in in such a way that it would per be purposely um, difficult to to understand and recognize. And that is part of what I'm, I'm trying to bring out. And mm. we want to do a series of videos that are examining different facets of that divine assayer, of that stumbling block, or it's a stumbling block and a rock of offense. Uh, that the, the messages of these figures historically, and I actually mean this whether or not you believe them or not, whether you're a Christian or not, yeah. <laughs> whether you're a Buddhist or not, or a Hindu or not, that you have these messages are presenting themselves at times in ways that actually appear deliberately jarring, almost like a trickster, yeah. if you will. And generally what happens is, is that tr the tr tradition that is presenting has a sense in the beginning that this message is jarring, that this message is shocking. Yeah. But then through time, through its own social dominance, it actually forgets this. Uh, one of the examples I often use is that people don't usually think of this in the context of the Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. But if you actually mm -hmm. read the Pali Canon of Buddhism, and you read it just as a Buddhist scripture, right? It's like, oh, this is interesting. There's this divine being and this divine being, yeah. and the Buddha is saying this, and his messenger, his disciples, for example, are even traveling into heavenly worlds to communicate with other, let's say, at least divinities or semi-divine beings. It doesn't really stick out until you put that in the context of the Upanishads. Yeah. Well, and you put that in the context of the Vedas. And the impression that I think most people get from the Buddhist um, text is that, is that it, it was presented and it came about um, and was presented in a sort of a, a, a neutral and, and, and detached sense from its Hindu context. Mm -hmm. Not at all in the sense that it was trying to negate anything in the Hindu scripture or theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it doesn't merely negate. It actually makes, uh, and we do actually do have a video on this, which yeah. is the ultimate reality in Buddhism. You actually have what is the Hindu pantheon made in many ways to be utterly and completely subservient to the Buddha. Wow. Uh, where you have characters like Indra and Varuna and Vayu and... Uh, are figures, if you will, divinities or expressions of divinity from the Rig Veda, 
and that are referenced in the Upanishads, like central, central, central uh, Hindu texts, that suddenly become disciples at the feet of the Buddha. Talk about a bold claim. <laughs> yeah, and the thing mm-hmm. is, is did it have to be communicated in that way? Yeah. Right? And that's what I really want to genuinely to explore. Is there beauty to that method? And that is also, <laughs> that's, that's sort of the core of what I want to look at, is mm-hmm. why would it be <laughs> this way? And I'm not saying it's like utterly and completely comprehensive and explains everything, but I think it's really important just to look at average and everyday life mm. and to examine that in the light, if you will, of testing, sacrifice, and troubling. Because I believe once we go through that, some of these things begin to make more sense. Yeah. Um, Are these quotes for, like, in, in that sort of, dis- elaborating more on that divine air concept, or is that... Um, something mm. of uh, some of the quotes that I brought, uh, and I actually have a larger document that we can go through in more of a okay. presentation style in the future. But what it is is I have certain uh, I have certain Baha'i quotes, certain secular quotes, and just some principles that I wanted to look at within the context, if you will, of the idea of sacrifice and testing and a saying. Um, you do have quotes, which again, I'd like to look at a different time, yeah. where, um, like the example we gave, where the stumbling block and a rock of offense in Christianity, uh, that Jesus' crucifixion in his very life was a stumbling block for the people, for the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. You actually have cases identically within the Quran, where the Quran says, we have done this to test humankind, mm-hmm. to test the believers. One of the examples is the changing of the Qibla. So I was thinking of, yeah. Right? Where Classic. could, could uh, God have maintained the focal point of prayer within Islam to be Jerusalem? Yeah. Of course he could have. Yeah. Unequivocally he could have. Did he but, know that have, uh, changing the Qibla <coughs> would have caused many of his believers to... Uh, turn away and to turn get away upset. Up, yeah. Yes. Does he tell us that he knew? Yes. Why did he then do it? Mm. He tells us to actually put the believers to a test. Um, And this is, like there's a a case, for example, and we'll look at this in the future, where Jesus Christ, I believe it's John 6, my memory is, you know, failing me at Mm. the moment. Uh, But what's happening is, is he's talking about, you know, you shall eat of my body and drink my blood, Mm -hmm. right? And yet it upsets the disciples. The apostles are actually upset by this. Let alone the Jews. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are his friends, his yeah. brothers, those yeah. his companions. And he says to them, does this offend you? Yeah. Right? And his, he's actually putting this forward. And again, we'll have to look at the text. I'm just giving the basic idea. He says, I'm actually doing this to attest you, to assay you, hmm. to almost put a block in front of you, for he who was offended by this, or offended by me, right? You shall not be named by God. Seems like it's like a trying to uh, coax out within you the the nature of of trying to understand the intention or symbolic meaning behind something, as opposed to reacting to its surface uh, meaning or words. I think it's a massive principle. I mean, we're getting a, a bit ahead of ourselves, yeah. but I think that's that's sort of what it's pointing to. I think I, like, and this is why to me, when uh, maybe we can come back to this. Yeah. It's why for me, like, I look at just life in general, right? Uh, We come into this world uh, ignorant and weak, right? Even by the time we're actually developing its psyches, uh, knowledge does not come easy. Uh, Physical strength, prowess, and stability. I mean, your physical temple, it's not an easy thing. If you actually wish to achieve beauty... Uh, and the heights of physical prowess, be it just in bodybuilding, be it in being a gymnast, Health, yeah. a dancer, you want to be a good racquetball player, any of these things, yeah. um, you will bleed, in, in some cases literally, to achieve it. Mm-hmm. You have to sacrifice hours of training. Your body hurts. You get tired. Um, so when it comes just simply to the physical world, to eat very healthy, 
right? To actually mm-hmm. maintain your physical temple at optimal performance, it, it actually demands sacrifice. Putting aside my desire for popcorn <laughs> and pop, you have to put aside what are very natural desires, very fundamental, basic, if you will, like gravitational pulls yeah. of our lower nature. Um, so that's actually true of any skill. Climbing Mount Everest is only precious and valuable and amazing because very, very, very few people can do it because it's so yeah. difficult. <laughs> or going to space or whatever. Any of them. Yeah. And in fact, this is the... And the, thank you very much, Charles, because that's the thing. It seems almost to be built fundamentally into the core understanding of what is beautiful. The yeah. core understanding of what is lovely, what is worthwhile. To me, I, I love hearing the cello. I don't play the cello, but I adore hearing the cello. If actually every single human being on the planet could play the cello, that just wouldn't be the same. Of course, yeah. It would be trivial. It's like a law of the universe in a way. In a weird... Yeah, it yeah. is. In some ways, I don't... I don't know if we're able to understand beauty or love or the admirable without the principle of sacrifice and pain mm-hmm. built into it. I love knowledge. I absolutely love learning. Uh, but it demands from, lots of time. Yeah. Time away from things that in, I guess you'd say in their immediate attraction are, are way more powerful <laughs> than learning. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it takes a great deal of sacrifice to achieve it. So that, does it go from the realm of truth? Yes. Does it in the realm of like physical prowess or physical skills? Yes, it is. It's built right in. The same thing goes for your emotional world. It's very easy to get frustrated. It's very easy to become impatient. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very hard to actually be patient. It's challenging to keep calm and collected in the face of constant obstacles, say frustration. It's a muscle. They all are. Mm -hmm. Honesty is a muscle. Honesty gets really, really tempted and really, really tried when lying will get you out of something. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's very easy to be honest about like what you had for breakfast this morning. But when you have done something wrong and you're asked to tell the truth, that's when honesty actually really has, uh, it, it, it's where it becomes truly, truly expressed, mm-hmm. is when there's sacrifice t- tied to it. Yeah. So I think in any world. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to see if I can uh, take a look at yeah. these quotes here. So did you want to go through some of these one by one, or did you want to... I should just read the first one, Okay. if you don't mind. Yeah, I can read it. Um, go ahead. It's from Bahá'u'lláh, one of the um, hidden words. And it says, O children of the divine and invisible essence, ye shall be hindered from loving me, and souls shall be perturbed as they make mention of me. For minds cannot grasp me, nor hearts contain me. So this is from the hidden words. Yeah. From Baha'u'llah. I remember the first time reading it, actually, and it was, it, uh, ironically, it perturbed me. Yeah. <laughs> I found it frustrating. <laughs> Because that idea of you shall be hindered from loving me, right? And what does it say? You shall be hindered from loving me. And souls shall be perturbed as they make mention of me yep. from minds. Because minds can't grasp me and hearts cannot contain me. So in a sense, you're being prevented yeah. from drawing close. Yeah. Not only prevented, but we're... We're incapable of doing that. Yeah, and that they're, they're to be perturbed. You're going to be frustrated. Yeah. You're going to have angst. This is like the concept of like the dark night of the soul, yeah. right? Or trying to reach that cloud of unknowing. It's, it, it's, you're always trying to approach, but you're never actually arriving. Yeah. And it's, this is why it, on the surface you hear this and it seems frustrating. Yeah, and, and, and it can be understood. I mean, if you understand it in an absolute sense, it seems like hopeless. But at the same time, if you understand it in a relative sense, that you, we can try and we can, there's a certain degree of to, to which we can grasp 
him or contain him, mm -hmm. if, if we can say such a thing, but to its complete sense or its absolute sense, it's not possible. You're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. Which is going to have Which a, is, yeah. a, a per, you're going to be perturbed. Right. And, and this is why. As it should be. As it should be. Um, it's why looking at the mundane nature of the world is so important to me. I love playing music. I play guitar. Mm. Uh, I can do things that currently that I never actually ever thought I would be able to do, musically speaking. Expressions of music that I just didn't think would ever be possible for me. And I'm looking now, you know, I'm almost 50, and I'm actually looking out to where I could achieve if my life continued to go, if I continued to move forward, and I wasn't prevented by old age and death. Mm -hmm. I know that I, my precision and perfection of that art would actually carry on for centuries and centuries mm -hmm. if I could actually live. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, again, it's not that strange. Whenever you move, it's, it's like, like the, the perfection of an art or a piece. And I know it, many of these things are cliche. And this yeah. is why, because it's true. Because as I move throughout my artistic expression, say musically, yeah. As I move towards what I once thought would be like the height of actually achievement in music, that horizon is constantly receding. Yeah. Can I read the next quote? It's actually, I think it's exactly on this yes. point as well. Because it's uh, on, the, on the concept of the fact that nature loves to hide. And it says, by its very nature, unity requires self-sacrifice. Self-love, the master states, is kneaded into the very clay of man. The ego, termed by him, the insistent self resists instinctively constraints imposed on it, what it conceives to be its freedom, to willingly forego the sanctification that license affords, the individual must come to believe that fulfillment lies elsewhere. Ultimately, it lies, as it always has done, in the soul's submission to God. Okay. And that's from the, the Baha'i World Center. And one, yeah, the one common faith. One common faith, yeah. Yeah, so that there's uh, this insistent self Right? Self-love in the negative sense is needed into the very clay of humankind. So, but we have to choose some form of restriction, some price. Yeah. A sense of sacrifice in order to achieve more lovely and beautiful things. Unity in this context. Yeah. But it applies everywhere. There's a very brief quote, if you don't mind. Yeah, this one's from The Guardian. The, the apathy? Yeah. Oh, sorry, actually. I had a quote. Uh, it's actually right here. Um, it's from Heraclitus. Oh, yeah, nature loves to hide. Nature loves to hide. Yeah. What does that mean? What's the context? Nature loves to hide. Because obviously, if you, if you look at it in the literal sense, there's, nature doesn't hide. It's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The context is actually, it's often used in the context of like the history and philosophy of science. Mm. Nature loves to hide meaning you see the surface, for example, of, yes, the natural world, but what's really happening. Hmm. Understanding chemistry and biochemistry, physics and geology. Uh, it's not merely just looking out and seeing what's happening. It's the knowledge of... It's actually nature. that the knowledge of the natural world demands sacrifice. It's the exact same thing. Hmm. Hmm. When you look wow. at the intellectual world, that, like, hmm. just knowing and understanding. If you want to understand geology, what's really happening... Yeah. Uh, you're going to sacrifice. If you want to understand biology, you're going to sacrifice. And again, to go to the previous quote about being perturbed and un un unable to be contained, it will always hide. Nature, nature will always be hidden in, in an absolute sense. Yes, it will. But of course, we are, we are to a certain extent, gradually, in a relative sense, understanding and knowing um, nature through struggle, through science, through experimentation, yeah. hypotheses, etc. Through the sacrifice of time and, <laughs> and effort. Yeah. Um, the example I've often given in the past with friends is I'll say, like, you take, like, one single dandelion in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And you really actually wanted to know as much as you possibly could about that dandelion. Right? Uh, it would, you could actually spend your entire life trying to understand, yeah. the, like, you know, the processes of photosynthesis and the biochemistry of a dandelion and how its cell structures are actually, you know what I mean? Like, down to the physics and atoms. and That's right. Yeah. Right down to subatomic particles and the yeah. very fabric of reality in one single object. 
let alone trying to look at, you know, how are dandelions used in symbolism and what is the history of that particular dandelion oh. and, you know, are there, how many species of dandelion are there? It would just keep going. It's infinite, yeah. So it's, it's this in the context of the physical world, the emotional world, the intellectual world, and you gave the example of uh, things like unity, patience, love, justice, mercy, compassion, empathy. When you get into the world say beyond that of truth and the power of the physical body and emotions, and you start going into the ethical world of virtue, uh, they are infinite. Yeah. And in every case, in my experience as a person, they demand a blood sacrifice. And if God yeah. has created such a universe, I think this is what it leads me to believe, in that if this is how creation is, uh, is designed, in that by principle, the, the universal principle of sacrifice and challenge and difficulty and overcoming obstacles to understand a higher degree of knowledge and truth, um, you would naturally expect that to be the case with scripture and revelation as well. That is really where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Like you're asking about like what, how is it that I view this? It's kind of like every single place I look, I see that principle in operation. That actually, I, I, there's a surface level I can get without sacrifice, right? Yeah. Whether it be, you know, physical movement or emotional or virtue or knowledge, yet if I wish to really understand what's going on, really achieve my potential, really become a good person, truly, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm going to actually have to sacrifice. So, and all of it, remember, right from the beginning, this mathematics of sacrifice, Mm. is tied to beauty and value, right? It's built right into it. By principle, yeah. So, wh yeah, why would I expect the greatest and most wonderful of things, the, mo the apex of the purpose of my existence, if you're a Buddhist or if mm -hmm. you're a Hindu or if you're a Muslim or if you're a Jew or a Christian, um, that it would actually, that would play out. And again... When we look into those worlds, we see the concept of sacrifice playing out in the sacrifice of Isaac, for example. Yeah. We have the sacrifice, for example, of one's family in the context of Buddhism. We have that same sacrifice playing out in the New Testament. We have that same sacrifice playing out in the history of Islam, where figures have to give up their comfort. We have the sacrifice mm -hmm. of one's family and homeland in the history of Abraham. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so how beautiful would it be to, to come across re a revelation, to use uh, the New Testament as an example, that Christ comes in such a way that isn't obvious, isn't easy, isn't, you know, handed to you. Um, conversely, it comes challenge, challengingly, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. um, and abrasive to what you would imagine or expect it to be and you are able to somehow look through that be patient use wisdom tact use uh, symbolism and try to understand things from from its intended purpose trying to understand its, int its intention uh -huh. um, and then having to to come to an understanding of what that truth lay hid in that um, claim for example that that like Christ said, to eat of my flesh, whatever that that might mean. Yeah. And then to, to have to come to that understanding and and, and see the truth in that, I, I could, you know, imagining myself, in, in, in putting myself in, in the shoes of someone who's first I'm experiencing this would be truly glorious. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, th that no wonder God does it that way. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, and to me, like you're using the example of the New Testament, oh. right? Put it this way, like in order to understand the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is to a Christian mind, the greatest, the true theophany, right? The shining forth of the light of God in the history of mankind. Everything prior to it being, if you will, a, a lead up to, right? That expression of Jesus Christ. Um, 
you want to really understand how that came about. And yes, the examples you're giving, like you see, wait a minute, he comes, in a sense, he doesn't come as a conquering messiah. He comes as an itinerant teacher. Yeah. From a back, and in the context of, of Rome, from like a backwoods province of Rome, where really Rome is power, and Rome is authority, and Rome yeah. is sovereignty. And what you have is you have this figure show up, and I do actually have a lot of empathy for the Jewish community. He shows up, right? He seems on the surface to flout Jewish law. He seems to make it less important, particularly when you get into the books of Acts and the epistles, where the, the Jewish law just seems to disappear. Yeah. Right? Um, and that, again, we're going to go through some of these particular examples in the future. You know, they're waiting, they're waiting the return of this great prophet, Isaac, or sorry, Elijah, to come and proclaim the coming of the Messiah, and they get some individual named John the Baptist who doesn't seem to do all that much, no. <laughs> right? And I really do think and it, that as you start going through this, you have like the, if you will, the dissolution of the Mosaic law, but you do have him in particular cases saying things like, you know, eat of my flesh and drink my blood, and then he gets crucified and dies. Yeah. All of this would be jarring to a, to a Jewish mind. To understand that that was the method of operation and the choice of God in his unfolding of his message to humankind, the real pivotal question that comes up is, could he do that again? Yeah. And I, and I see that the quality, like, if I were to put myself in the, in the shoes of, of uh, God, <laughs> if, I can, yeah, if I can't do such a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but seeing a soul in, encounter that, like let's say a Jewish soul, we're running with this, this example here, yeah, yeah. to to encounter that and and say and really struggle and say, okay, well, I'm expecting none of this. Um, this goes counter to many of the things that are that that are said in the in the Torah and the Tanakh. And then I'm told by my head teachers. All of it. Um, but there's something about this that um, could be true. Mm -hmm. And it needs a bit more time and investigation. I want to hear him out. I want to see what is meant by these things. Um, what does it mean that he's, his, he's the son of man? What does it mean that, that he's, he's the son of God? The son of God. Yep. Um, why would we eat of his flesh when we are told explicitly not to do, I mean... Yeah, or drink blood. None of that. It's yeah. just uh, abhorrent. So could there be something else to it? Could there be um, another meaning behind it? I mean, if not, then, hey, my initial instincts were correct. But if there is, then there's a lot at stake here. I should be really careful. And I could see, again, to go... To use my example that I was trying to give from the perspective of God, I would I would see that a soul as just so beautiful and so precious and and um, wise and 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 uh, perceptive humble. and deep and and humble. Yeah. And um, like I want more of those people in existence. Mm -hmm. I want these are my true children. Um, that's how I would I I I understand how I see. Um, the, the lessons being taught throughout the Tanakh and as well in, in the other scriptures that the kind of person and the kind of soul that's trying to be nurtured and raised up, mm -hmm. um, which, is the, which is, again, points to the fact as to why he would come in those ways, to, again, to find those individuals mm -hmm. that are that way. And this is the thing, is you actually have, like, individuals like this praised, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Or actually, they're willing to sit down and reason through the scriptures. Nicodemus. Yeah. You actually have individuals that are like, wait a minute. Uh, let me put this aside for now and truly look. Why I think it's important is because not only was that necessary for the Jewish individuals and Roman pagans. Like, you'd actually have to look at Rome, which is undeniably the most powerful empire that anyone has seen to date. Yeah. Right? And then say, like, wait a minute. So I understand these are the gods of Rome 
and Rome could squash all of Palestine, <laughs> right? The entire Jewish world, right? But here's this, you know, this strange individual in the backwoods who's actually giving a message, who obviously eventually then conquers Rome through his message. But you actually had to put that aside. It's like today when I hear people say, oh, well, you know, I go with, like, say, Christianity, because really it was Judeo-Christian values that brought us to this beautiful place of, you know, say, like, the Western civilization. Well, by that rationale, you would actually never investigate Christianity if you were in Rome. Mm-hmm. Because you would say, wow, look at the, you know, the profound power of Rome in this day. We've never seen an empire anywhere like this. Obviously, I'm going to attribute it to Zeus and Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what you would do. You would look by. So there has to be a sense that, well, this small, tiny, pun intended seed has within it the potential to become an extremely, unfathomably powerful tree. Whereon all the rest of these will fade away. You mm-hmm. actually had to do that. Yeah. What I think is important to notice is that is actually what the Jewish community had to do in the case of Moses. Hmm. Because this is what I think is really important. Yeah. If you were a Jew at the time <coughs> of the coming of Moses, right? Um, I always used to call them Josephites because like the last like major figure of, of, of the book of Genesis that you see is actually Joseph. Prior to Moses. Prior to Moses, yeah. right? So you're actually living in uh, Egypt. So you're in Egypt and you've been following the tradition of your fathers for centuries. You're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You truly believe them to be the patriarchs of the Jewish community, right? Here you are, and then all of a sudden, some figure shows up. Mm-hmm. And he claims... To be the voice of your God. It's one thing to lead them out of Israel. Any sort of leader or mm-hmm. general could have, not that he could have done that, but uh, that the- theoretically could have been that role that that person fulfilled. Mm-hmm. But there's something far above the, beyond that that's being claimed from Moses, um, which is that he's bringing a message direct from God. He's the mirror to God and his face shines with the light of God. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Yeah, it says it like you, he is God unto Pharaoh, for example, in the book yeah. of Exodus. And that he is God unto Aaron and Aaron is like his prophet. Um, you're talking about when his face radiates after coming down off Mount Sinai. Yeah. All that might be okay. <laughs> as strange as that may be. But what ends up happening is, is a religion that is given to the Jewish people post-Egypt is, in its external form, a religion that was actually not undertaken by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I see, okay. So the Mosaic law that is seen by many of the Jewish community and seems to be, in many cases, in the case of the Tanakh, to be a perpetual unfolding, a perpetual series of ordinances and statutes, is actually given in the dispensation of Moses. Well, it's not, and, and, and every time it is uh, unfolded and, and given throughout uh, the ages by various prophets in the Tanakh, it's not like it was always immediately accepted by the Jewish community and everyone obeyed. No, it wasn't. <laughs> if anything, the, the, the Tanakh is a history of just constant rebellion and disobedience. That's right. You actually have an ongoing struggle. Why? And you have, throughout the history of Moses' own dispensation, yeah. the people murmuring against him, the people questioning, why did we come out into the desert? We should have stayed in Egypt. And to me, the, the core is to go back to that principle of not only do you have to give up what you knew, to give up what was familiar in the context of where you had been for centuries as a people, you also actually had to take on an entire new garment of an expression of your religion mm-hmm. given to you by Moses. When you all of a sudden have the concept of like the tabernacle and the sacrifices and the food laws and clothing laws, were those revelations that you see prior to the coming of Moses? No. Yeah. There's a quote here from, from the Tanakh that says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Yeah, it's a beautiful quote. Proverbs. Yeah. So it's this sense where that which is beautiful is hidden Mm -hmm. by the very, that's how I take many of these, by the very nature of the reality that we live in. 
right? But to search out and try to understand is the glory mm -hmm. of not only kings, but of all people. We should probably wrap up uh, soon. Um, mm. If you don't mind, I was going to see if you can read this one last uh, passage from Pensees. Pensees? I don't know how to pronounce Oh, that. this is actually Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal. Yeah. From Pascal's Wager? or Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A very famous uh, Christian. Okay. He says, if he had willed to overcome the obstinacy of the most hardened, he could have done so by revealing himself so manifestly to them that they could not have doubted the truth of his essence. It is not in the, this manner that he has willed to appear in his advent of mercy, because, as so many make themselves unworthy of his presence, he has willed to leave them in the loss of the good which they do not want. It was not then right that he should appear in manner manifestly divine and completely capable of convincing all men, but it was also not right that he should come in so hidden a manner that he could not be known by those who should sincerely seek him. He has willed to make himself quite recognizable by those, and thus willing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart, and to be hidden from those who flee from him with all their heart. He also, he so regulates the knowledge of himself that he has given signs of himself visible to those who seek him, and not to those who seek him not. There is enough light for those who only desire to see and enough obscurity for those who have a contrary disposition. So perceptive, wow. Is that an exquisite quote? Yeah. Obviously why I included it, yeah. right? Because it means that uh, this is why you have statements like this. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you, to him who has eyes to see, yeah. has ears to hear, right? If you wanted to listen to the message of the Buddha, and be offended and turn aside. Mm -hmm. You have enough that are given to you. Yep. But if you desire to know the truth and to not to know the true Dharma, to understand Brahman as best you can, there is enough there to lead you in. If you want to become offended by the statements of Jesus Christ and the obvious external way in which he appeared, then so be it, go on your way. Yeah. But if you actually desire to know the secret things of God and the beloved things of God, then there is enough there to lead you in. If you want, Lord. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the thing. So if you want to actually see the beauty, uh, you can move in. If you want to be uh, upset by the external expression of how, for example, the Quran speaks of Jesus mm -hmm. and not wonder what else might be behind that, you can turn aside. The Quran itself says we, strike, we, can, we can strike a similitude between a gnat or a lesser creature. And by such similitudes, by such symbols, we lead some into heaven and some into hell. That actually the, the, the very nature of revelation from God is that divine concealment and that divine manifest. Wow. The most manifest of the manifest and the most hidden of the hidden. That you can either turn if you love and listen, humble yourself and enter, or if you so wish it, turn away and go to the end of your days believing you were completely right. Yeah. So. That's beautiful. Thank you. We'll leave it there. And okay. We'll, maybe we'll continue the rest of it next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Blessing.